So what I'm an advocate of is that we're going to have to make a constructive deal when that happens. I am certainly an advocate for not persecuting the ANC and its history and grinding it into the dust and saying that it is the root cause of every ill that has ever befallen this country. I think doing that and excluding it from a future government would be a serious mistake and would breed deep-seated resentment and unhappiness for which we will pay a great price in future generations. Hello everybody, this is Soli again. Welcome to another session of Worldview, the number one media company. This is where we explore everyone's perspective on things that can burden our own worldview. It happens all the time. Today, I'm really excited to be hosting Franz Cunier. He's very well known to be almost like the, um, the Sangoma of South African politics. <laughs> South Africa, or the socio-economic environment in South Africa, if you want to know what's going to happen, who's going to be in bed with whom, what's going to come out of it, go and look for Franz Cunier. Franz Cunier, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for, for that introduction. It's the first time I've had one like that, and um, it's very nice to be with you. Uh, Franz Cunier is, of course, the former CEO of, this, uh, of the Race Relations Institute of South Africa. He's now with the uh, Social Research Foundation. Of South Africa. He's still in the same business of predicting, looking at details, numbers, and people movements, and predicting where they're going to go. I don't know if there's another Sangoma who does this as well as you probably do. <laughs> or maybe you're getting all the media that all the Sangomas are not getting, friends. <laughs> so, no, so, um, yeah, no, no, I'm still in that business. That's right. Um, yeah. I mean, I had good preparation for this, for this over the years going going all the way back to someone who had a huge influence and was amazingly helpful in Clem Hunter, who was, right. Right. you know, he, he was, he really was the guy uh, because he he got a lot of that right in, in the eighties. And he actually was trained by, by the great uh, guru of them all. The, the head of the shell, famous shell strategic planning team, Pierre Wack, who got the shell board to anticipate right. Right. the oil price spike in 1973. Mm -hmm. So, no, I've, I've had a lot of, of help and support from, from Clem over the years and from my former think tank colleagues. And um, Clem is, a, is an amazing storyteller. How is he doing? Well, very well. I actually saw him <laughs> about two weeks ago in Cape Town. Yeah. He, he's, he's, he's looking great. He's still the, the sort of great raconteur uh, that he was. And, you know, he, was a, he, he, he might have been a musician. Yeah, and he actually and it, had a, a, a sort of fleeting sort of appearance of sorts so with the Rolling Stones as a, okay. as a youngster. Interesting. And, and I think it's that background that made him so highly effective. And, and you know what, what, what Clem did very well is um, if, if you want, the whole scenario field works, it's not about the future. It's, it's about changing behavior in the present. Right. And, and, and he was so good on stage and in front of so many audiences yeah. in, in the 80s that he managed to get people not to wait to see, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to change their behavior in the present. And, and De Klerk credited him with uh, being very useful in helping De Klerk to, to see what needed to be done mm -hmm. to the, his then cabinet right. to drive the reforms and, um, the, you know, of, of, as as an individual analyst mm. goes in terms of influence on change. Mm. I like, I like. Clem's word was tremendous, right. yeah. He has this infectious laughter as well that I really like. Yes, and he'd, he'd laugh at his own joke. <laughs> yeah, he laughed at good. his own joke. People were That's laughing right. at, 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 at <laughs> that. <laughs> That's right. But he was also so hard not to laugh when he starts laughing. <laughs> he really yes, laughed. Yes, quite, but, uh, yeah. but did, I mean, you said people listen to him, they change their behavior. Is the current government, has he tried to influence ANC at any stage since it came into power? And have they ever yeah, listened on, to him? On, 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 on him. Um, I think he's still influential, um, mm. certainly. I mean, we'll, we'll talk a bit about uh, today, I'm sure, broader influence right. on the ANC and, right. and its behavior and, and where it gets messaging from. Mm. But the great, I mean, the, the, the trigger is, is pressure always. Mm. And pressure is a wonderful thing because it breeds reform. Right. And and failing that it breeds changes of administration. Uh, yeah. So the 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 as the pressure has been building over the past decade uh, or so, just more than a decade, real pressure. Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, this 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 becomes the question. I mean, the thing I'm faced with, my, my sort of people who talk to me put, put the question to me: What, you know, do do we see another transition? Um, yeah, we'll get to that. But let's talk about the Institute, but, yeah. Institute of Race Relations. People yeah. tend to either accuse it of being right wing, too close to the DA. I mean, what do you make of that? You know, almost almost a hundred years old. Mm. Um, uh, arguably Africa's longest established think tank in, in very good shape. Uh, fairly big staff by, you know, the way these things, these are, things are in emerging markets. Mm. Through, throughout its history, um, unpopular in key corners of the country. I mean, for much of that history, it was uh, seen as far too hard to the left, a sort of uh, right. a proxy for the Soviet Union of, of all the... <laughs> The, the crazy things it could have been um, uh, named as. I don't think it really ever shifted in terms of its fundamental beliefs mm -hmm. in um, the importance of a society where the economy is dictated by market principles in the main, uh, property rights being the anchor of substantive human liberty in, in all free societies and the ability of individuals, really any child born in a society should rightly be able to aspire to a safe, comfortable and, and, and prosperous life. Um, it was it, towards the end of my ten, tenure there, what was interesting about it is, is, is there were you know, a number of groups who, who were critical. And one of the most critical through many of the year, my, my latter years was, was in fact the DA itself. I mean, we, we had some uh, ding-dong battles uh, that went on. Um, was never afraid of that. It never sought popularity. Um, and it didn't depend very heavily on donor funding at all, uh, traditional donor funding. In fact, I think by the time I left, it, it was really down to about middle of that. But it had um, significant popular support of, of, of ordinary people. did very well out of crowdfunding towards the end. Is it and yeah. In dark, in private, it was very widely consulted about it, which which had been the case uh, through, throughout much of its history. But if, um, if if most people in current day South Africa are suspected of being right wing, then it surely becomes a problem for its name. If the majority no. of the people suddenly stops, uh, you know, um, well, can I, you hear me? I, yes, I can. Yes. Okay. No. Okay. I don't think a majority of people do suspect it of being right wing. One of the strengths it always had is a, bit, uh, a fair amount of, of opinion, research and analysis. Mm -hmm. And okay. it was very confident that public opinion in South Africa was far more center right than many of the louder, more popular voices in the country understood and that the policy positions that the IRR advocated for uh, were probably broadly in line with mass public opinion. But that wasn't the point for it. You see, this is the thing few people understood about it. It really didn't care if it was popular or not. It was established uh, long ago to guard and advocate for a certain set of principled positions. And it, it would do so whether public support for that was high or public support for that was low. And this is what it did throughout its history. And I often had the question, well, shouldn't you sort of change your position so that, you know, popular people will like you more? And, and inside it itself, it found that an absurd suggestion. It, uh, uh, um, it, it felt that it needed to advocate around principles it was established to defend and it, it also felt that positively these principles probably resonated more deeply with public opinion in the country than than its critics understood yeah look i don't think i wouldn't suggest that it changes its stances on things or just to please people the majority is not always right but sometimes would you need to be aware of what people are saying about you so that you communicate better differently you explain better so that the minute you nobody listens to you and you don't care whether they listen to you or not, then it becomes a bit not helpful. Yeah, yeah you anyway. know yeah. How, how I dealt with that, and it's an interesting question, is that there's so much pressure on you in such a role to accommodate this critic or that critic, that if you start to do that, 
you there's no telling where you're going to end. Right. And our our view was the opposite that that the message won't be tailored. If if it's if it's hard to hear, you know, you're going to have to deal with that. But but I can I I mean one day I might write a book about this. The scope of groups and organizations that consulted it privately, often in the dark, so no one could see that they had come to see it. Nicodemus that was I I that that was immense. I mean that Whoa. was around the world that was absolutely immense right. and and so privately we we felt that in terms of serious influence mm. um, okay. there, there was a lot going on yeah okay let's move on to south africa now uh the ANC in the next two weeks or so will be will emerge with another set of leaders uh this i saw in the media this morning there's a whole thing of the whole group of people who are not too happy with Paul Matashile becoming the next possible deputy to Ramaphosa, if Ramaphosa wins, he's expected to win, of course. They are all clamoring to make sure that they put all sorts of obstacles in his way. What do you see coming out of this? Are the stands still shifting in terms of what's going to emerge? Or, or do we have a fairly good idea of what's going to come out of it? I don't know what's going to come out there. Um, I think it's too early to say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I don't know what the result's going to be, but and and it matters, of course, it matters what the result right. is. But 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 at another level, it matters less mm-hmm. because beyond who whomever the ANC now elects to lead it, the the party is being swept along by tides and currents that are so powerful that I think it would be very difficult for anyone, even a remarkable leader, to um, alter those. So let, let's go through those a little bit. The mm-hmm. uh, first one is that the government that the ANC runs has, in effect, run out of money. Um, the budget deficit, as in, in, in immediately recent years, uh, rivaled the depths that the deficit had seen since the formation of the union. It was only in the in the 1980s and in the aftermath of the Second and First World Wars. That South Africa was at this level of deficit. Now, now deficits are triggers for administration changes in free and less free societies. We're a very free one because they mark us an uh, administration that's run out of the resources to meet the expectations of its erstwhile supporters. Second thing the, the ANC has essentially run out of is electricity, which means it doesn't have a short-term growth or investment recovery prospect. And the numbers here are, are very serious. We produce at the peak point in any day about 24, 25,000 megawatts at the peak hour of a day. My own estimates are that we need to add another 20,000 to that in the next decade if we wish to um, replicate by the end of that decade the growth rates of comparable emerging markets. Failing that, those levels of growth, we cannot do much to erode the very high youth unemployment rate, which sits at above above 50 percent amongst young people now about 15 years ago the the anc we must talk about its early stages as well because these are misunderstood this country's economic growth rate does reach five percent and in the era that it ramps from three to four and then for four years it maintains five the unemployment rate is brought down from almost 30 percent to just above 20 percent so the anc is not going to be able to bring down unemployment the unemployment rate is uh, anchors the massive economic exclusion uh, um, around which ANC support amongst uh, slightly better educated, more urban, younger people has been lost entirely. If, if an election were held today, we, we poll a lot in this re- social research foundation. And let's say only urban people, or people who lived in urban circumstances voted, the ANC would get 30%. It's lost that market forever. It will never get it back again. But that's also um, assuming that's also assuming that the so-called independent electoral commission is independent and has no influences, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. We'll, we'll get but we to need that. To but, you know, by the time you're, if, if you're at 49%, 48%, Maybe you can, you know, engineer a few things. When you're 20 points below 50, 
I mean, you, you need to suspend the rule of law, destroy the constitutional ed edifice entirely and evacuate the middle class. If you think you're going to you're going to cheat your way from 30 to 50, you're not going to do it very easily at all. But but you shouldn't be naive about the risks. So the ANC's lost. It's, it's run out of money for the government. It runs electricity. It's run out of support of the future electoral market. It does very well amongst older people and, and rural people and less educated people, and for very good reason, because if you're an older person in rural South Africa, you've got living memory experience of growing up as a black person in rural South Africa under apartheid. And what you face today is, is in, in, in the relative sense of things, a, a very, very much better world that you live in. So the ANC's lost that. It's lost credibility. Um, it was carried to power on the shoulders of the media and civil society and the diplomatic corps. When Mr. Ramaphosa recently met Mr. Biden in, in, in America, the important American newspapers didn't carry that story the next day. He's been covered now in, in the UK, but that's more the pomp and ceremony of a state yeah. uh, a visit and a golden carriage and, and you know, the, as, the, these things. It's also lost. Is it? Would it just a minute? Would it also be if you take America? I mean, we have a very useless ambassador there. You used to be was there even a more useless ambassador, a mayor of Cape Town. Surely, the role that the diplomatic missions in in the receiving state play ahead of a state visit is also important. How seriously yeah. they are taken, how well they know how to play the game, also does determine yeah. whether um, the extent to which the the, the state visit would make an impact, a big one or no, or not. It's a very sad thing, but many of our important diplomatic posts are, I mean, it's hard to represent South Africa at all, but 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 they make it a lot harder than it needs to be because the basic competence to do so isn't there. Mm -hmm. And and you speak about, about America and, and some time back, I was due to talk there and what we've done in previous years, when, when certainly when Mr. Rasul was the ambassador and he was quite good. Yeah. is um, I'd, I'd speak perhaps somewhere and, and we'd invite the ambassador as a respondent. And it was really, I mean, Rasul was good at that. Mm -hmm. And when I suggested this to, to an American friend uh, uh, um, a little, some, some, some time back, they said, with the greatest of respect, inviting your ambassador onto a serious platform would be an embarrassment for your country. I and, believe it. So and let, let's not. And, and that was that was that was jarring. So the, the ANC is now running out of many assets. One, one of the further assets it's run out of is is the intellectual depth to think its way out of this problem that it's in. Mm -hmm. um, when when I still had the team, I'm on, on on my own essentially of people. Um, are, you, we, are you talking about the debt of the ANC, the political party, or the debt of South Africa because of the ANC? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, the 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 no, South Africa. I'm, I'm more upbeat on than than mm -hmm. and, and 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 the ANC. I'll give you some options on it too. But yeah. the ANC. If, if I used to tell the young analysts, you know, go back, you know, especially these youngsters who were sort of born in I don't know the 1990s, and and say to them, you know, go go back and watch some YouTube clips of parliamentary debates of the early 1990s, or go watch a State of the Nation speech. Which, which at the time, watching it, we some of us were critical of. We thought this isn't nearly good enough. But, but, you know, relative to what came later, I mean, this was masterclass. The debates we used to have at the IRR with Tabo and Becky. Remember, he used to write a newsletter on a Friday mm -hmm. afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget what it was, ANC yeah. Today or something. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and and we used to wait on a Friday to see what he was going to do with us. And 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 it really challenged us in Berkey. And and you know, we, we'd have to think really hard through that Friday afternoon into how we're gonna counter this. And then we'd we'd counter and then then Berkey would probably, you know, we imagine him sitting there with his, his pipe and his whiskey and thinking these 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 damn <laughs> neoliberals and, and then he'd you can't do that anymore, and it was great. It really was good, and 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 you can't do that anymore because you the, the 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 caliber to sustain that sort of debate is no longer there. So so the ANC has lost the intellectual depth, and and then it gets its own and internal structural issues. Its branches, which are supposed to 
represent the views of, of its members or, or our people, as, as the ANCs want to call them, don't do the opposite. They divorce the membership from the leadership because that branch that nominates its, its, its person to attend a conference actually might have a view, we, we should vote for candidate A or B, but what happens at the conference and how that person votes, no telling. This is why I'm not sure what we're going to get mm. out of out of the ANC by the end of December. And uh, brown, brown envelopes have not really disappeared. And, I mean, and not... internally, the the, the, the the financial position's weak, the, the, the structure's weak, the ability to communicate's weak. If so, so the 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 ANC is 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 wherever it turns, whoever takes it over. I mean, you, you imagine you do, you, I do, you do. We win. We amazing. Hmm. The next morning, when you sit down and you you kind of ask for, you know, the management to come in and brief you. I mean, you must think, wow, how do we get out of this? Yeah. So I think it is fatally flawed now in the sense of being an organization with the capacity to craft the policies that it needs to restore itself to a successful governing administration with a confident national majority. And that's the key point. Mm -hmm. And whoever takes it over uh, um, isn't going to change that assessment, I don't think. I and mean, surely the ANC has come down so far and so much that it really wouldn't take one man or one woman to change, to reverse the culture. The erosion has been, has gone so deep. When uh, yeah. you think, people keep saying, yeah, if, if Ramaphosa grows a backbone, it's not going to happen. You can turn this thing around. Uh, the, it does, the, 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 the Mr. Mandela, when he is released from prison, makes his first kind of powerful economic policy statement, the blueprint at Davos in 92. Mm. Now that's before the ANC has got its own policy act together. And there's the difference between the two men. I mean, Mr. Ramaphosa puts the blueprint down because he's, he, I mean, Mr. Mandela puts the blueprint down in, in, in what was really a ruthless display of, of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 he 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 stares down his ideological critics. You see, he uh, my my take was always that, and and supported by by people who were there, mm -hmm. that Mandela understood that the hole they were inheriting from the Nats was so deep as it I mean it was it'd been, mm -hmm. I mean in South Africa had last seen solid sustained growth in the middle of the nineteen sixties. Yeah. I mean, from the 70s, it was it was volatile and chaotic. He understood that unless we turned economically and drew massive amounts of investment, we he his government with would within five years be at the IMF. And then the revolution's <laughs> done because you've borrowed in dollars. And a piece of law that I think runs deep in the ANC kind of zeitgeist is you don't borrow in dollars because they'll get you and they're right. And, and, and that fiscal prudence, it's extreme fiscal conservatism. Mm -hmm. That prudence uh, uh, has been a thread that continues to run uh, through the party. I mean, 13 years after coming to power, the ANC records a budget surplus. I mean, where in the world do you find a government, find a Western democracy that can secure a budget surplus? Very difficult. You're not going to find it. The, the, the trade unions were not very we happy with that. Said, well, and more than that, money on us. More than that, while, while I'm carrying on like an ANC propagandist for you, more than that, the ANC had cut government debt levels in half in that first decade. Mm. And the saving on the interest bill, because for, for some of your viewers, governments pay interest on their debt, same way that we do. So if you cut your debt, your interest bill is right. cut. Right. The saving on the interest bill financed the rollout of the social welfare program. And this wasn't accidental this was 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 very 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 sophisticated um Good economic management. planning and strategy right. now um in his mini budget two weeks ago or so three weeks ago um the finance minister mr gordon guana does i think a tremendous job mm -hmm. in 
mitigating the consequences of the policies of his government. He doesn't have the power to change those policies, mm-hmm. but he, you know, maybe he would if he had the power. But he, in the practice, cuts real spending on the civil service and on social welfare at a moment that his party is staring an electoral defeat in the face, 500 days from now. Now, that streak of conservatism uh, uh, runs in the party because of this awareness that 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 you you if you borrow in dollars you can into serious trouble. <laughs> Saved us in the, at the financial crisis, uh, two thousand and eight, the global financial crisis. Now that kind of ruthless determination mm-hmm. is in a single individual, which Mandela planted in the ANC after its twenty. ANC had always been quite a conservative organisation. Uh, it, it even suspends its liberation demands in support of Smuts's efforts in the Second World War because it's going to help. And and Black South is Africa, it, large is numbers. Has the ANC been conservative, or maybe it had a level of pragmatism? Well, I'd say I'd say by today's standards, mm. it would be seen as a as a conservative organisation in the same way that in your introduction you suggested the IRR is seen as a conservative <laughs> organisation. In other words, pragmatic. Right. Right. But but the the ANC even it's, it's an important little anecdote of history. Even suspends mm. its liberation demands in support of. Allied efforts in the Second World War. Mm-hmm. And black South Africans in very large numbers go to North Africa and go to Italy and, and are very brave. And on return, the, the naive hope that by demonstrating, you know, this, this the, there'd be concessions on civil rights is dashed. And 1948 happens and Smuts is defeated. And, and this, this, this pragmatic, let's call it that, mm-hmm. group is, is persecuted severely, uh, far worse than before. And being squeezed, it's got to pop out somewhere, and it pops out in the embrace of the East Germans and the Soviets, culminating in the ideological decisions of the ANC conference at Morogoro in 1969, 68, 69. And uh, so that so, so the ANC has a sort of 20-year flirtation with um, well, well, up, up to 69, and then then afterwards with with what would by today's standards be seen more um, uh, sort of left-wing <coughs> policy, but it's not, it's not consistent with its early origins entirely. Mandela in Davos, in, in that speech, takes it back to what it was, pragmatic uh, uh, in, in the main. And he does so with single-handed, ruthless determination. Mm-hmm. Mr. Ramaphosa is, is widely criticised and hounded and you know, useless, lazy, no mm-hmm. backbone, whatever. I, I, I think, you know, I mean, he, he leads the country, he must be responsible for the consequences. But I think the personality and the challenge weren't the right combination. Yeah. Had What I mean is that had, let's say Mr. Ramaphosa had taken over a South Africa comfortably growing at 4 or 5% with 10% unemployment and double the fixed investment to GDP ratio of today, which is low ratio and pretty sound institutions and you no know, capable law enforcement. And, and he'd governed that for 10 years. I think he would have been gone down in history of one of the great African leaders. Yeah, but uh, no, he didn't. The thing we gave him a challenge of our times and he's failed in the challenge of our times. Well, he failed in that challenge. But as I say about <laughs> who, who will now lead well, I mean, the yeah, again, I don't, about I don't who, think short of, of, of the ruthless brilliance of a Mandela, that right, they could get out right, of the hole that, right. that they were in by the time he took over. Yeah. And I don't think that changes, which means mm. the hole persists, which means the ANC's prospects of retaining a majority sort of, short of the kind of uh, destruction mm. of, of the constitutional edifice mm. is very unlikely. And this Can is I, the reality whoever yeah. comes out on top in December is going to face, leading mm. to the question of when we go and vote in 500 days' time, because we surely will, mm. and, and we get a, get a result you know, and let's, let's, let, let's not go there. I want to. to What's going to happen? Yeah. Let, okay. let, let's go. Let's let's we we did it. Now, do you think it would take a strong man? I mean, Zuma, he was a really bad guy for South Africa. But people tend to say when he made a decision, he made it. He was a boss. He was president. He made all the wrong decisions, but it was clear he was a boss. People feared him. Uh, Mandela, he had the aura. People feared and loved him, and he was not your your 
benevolent dictator and he was very clear about where he stood on many things. Uh, Ramaphosa is all over the place. Even he, his own ministers are going out saying nasty things about him, and uh, and he doesn't. The thing is, he seems to be trying to please everyone all the time. And you can't be when you lead not only just the broad movement that the African National Congress is when you lead a country as complex as South Africa. You have to be clear. You can't be a darling for everybody. And he's trying that, and it's failing him big time. I don't think that he would not have been who he is today if he had taken over from Mandela. He's this is the man that is being revealed to be who. He is okay. here's the here's a problem that we face and tends to be overlooked there is no country that was poor and became free that then became rich i put this to you mm -hmm. and then your viewers some of them might think of somewhere no country was poor and became free mm -hmm. and then became rich in the last 100 years okay every every poor society that became prosperous was led by a, a ruthless um Kagame style person Singapore well, who, the uh, Neverland uh, dictator Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore <laughs> Park in Korea Deng in China maybe Kagame in Rwanda yeah. in those early at, at the expense of human rights right well the price to pay yes but you must think carefully through that problem too because what let's say China mm. right human rights abuser what china has done to lift billions of people mm -hmm. out of the most desperate poverty where you live in a hole in the ground mm -hmm. has done for um human rights a, a, a great deal too and and th this is this is the, the 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 challenge for a lot of liberal thinkers uh, classically liberal thinkers the, the kind of ir thinkers that, that many in the sort of global classically liberal or if you use the term properly conservative world don't rise to is that why is it that the countries that become try to become free don't become prosperous and i think there's a the the intellectual arguments that will get you around that but but in when we look at our lamentable state one of the things to consider is that we try to do it differently by becoming a free society. And when you do that, you become, you, you, you suffer from what's sometimes called the democratic deficit, mm. which is that, that people get a say in what happens. Ford, who of the cars, said if I asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for faster horses. Now, you mustn't construe from this. So is, it, is, it, is it democratic I'm, deficit or democratic surplus? Well, it's, it could be. It's, well, it's a deficit in the sense that it, retards economic progress i'm a great advocate for example of of south africa building a nuclear fleet me too but not under the ANC. we need we need twenty thousand megawatts of electricity. that's but as much not, as the country but needs not today. under not managed by a um, criminal cover but but if not managed by so we outsource it to someone else of course i mean these, these problems can be overcome <laughs> What um, what will happen though when South Africa does that is is activists fully within their rights and I, I you mustn't misconstrue that I'm a um, uh, have, have anything but a great determination to maintain South Africa's status as a free society will probably be sufficient small groups of them with a little bit of foreign money will be sufficient to delay a project like that for twenty years an entire generation of South Africans might continue to live literally if, if you live in a shack mm -hmm. surrounded by cast iron she tin sheets mm -hmm. you live in a hole in the ground that's essentially what your life is like it is it is terrible and green activists and anti-nuclear activists in south africa small in number have the power to play a role in sustaining that now that that challenge i once had had lunch with um i won't say who he was but the 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 high commissioner of a successful country in Asia. And I said to him, but but you guys were were sort of very dictatorial. And he said, not at I said you were authoritarian. He said, we weren't. And I said, well, what were you? He said, we were 
you could do whatever you wanted as long as it was in the best interest of the state. So, so. <laughs> Who determined? But, but, no, but on, on a serious yeah. note, but when, oh, when you, you can do that. You can get away with that sort of thing when you run a very a fairly homogeneous society. Then in South Africa, is not. And with the well, what, what this Africa. chap in fact said, I, you, you the, the, in, in the same conversation a couple of years back, uh, he said no. He said that's wrong. He said, because we had the authority to do this, mm-hmm. we were able to force the homogeneousness that otherwise right. we wouldn't have had. Right. And, and then the, the differences play out. And the, the only point I'm trying to make is that, is that when people look to our future and try and understand the challenges we face, sometimes that analysis is far too superficial. Mm-hmm. And one of the great challenges we need to meet is how to do this as a fundamentally free and open society. Yeah. which it will be a we will be a tangent to the rule we will be one of the first that has done this in 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 living memory to get that right yeah. and and <laughs> it's not to say that we should erode the constitutional protections that we just need to be aware that sometimes it's a sort of lazy analysis we became free so obviously well, we're going to come prosperous in, in fact the two don't necessarily hold together okay let's run to the future a little bit before we run out of time uh, you seem to be a proponent of the African National Congress, apparently the good side of the African, I don't know which one that is, honestly, you need to tell me, joining hands with the DA to lead South Africa, hopefully into prosperity. How would that happen and which side of the ANC would you consider to be a good side of the ANC? Because I'm really struggling with that. Look, we're going we're gonna to have to make a deal in 2024, 2029. And, um, we 29 need to is too far, 24, let's talk 24. Yeah, yeah, but let, let's say maybe. I mean, I, I, there's some polls that we've done where if we if we try a little bit too hard, I can just get the ANC to cling on to kind of 51% by its fingernails. So it's 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 you know we, you mustn't. I mean, the likelihood is it's going to lose, but it's not assured, particularly given the the conflict inside the ranks of the opposition. So what I'm an advocate of is that we're going to have to make a constructive deal when that happens. I am certainly an advocate for not persecuting the ANC and its history and grinding it into the dust and saying that it is the root cause of every ill that has ever befallen this country. I think doing that and excluding it from a future government would be a serious mistake and would breed deep-seated resentment and unhappiness for which we will pay a great price in future generations. Wait, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I, who would exclude it? I mean, if the people vote against the ANC and the ANC so doesn't get to control the IEC, come well, on. The ANC, this is democracy. It wasn't designed so to stay in power forever. A, I mean, excluding it from a coalition. That's what I mean. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not an, a supporter of the idea that that the, the purpose of coalition government is to exclude the ANC from, from, from government. Right. Uh, that, that's, that's, I, I think that's a very dangerous idea. I think that for a few reasons. One is even at 30%, the ANC will continue to represent the interests of millions of people and that government should try to be broadly representative. But on a more strategic, from a more strategic perspective, mm-hmm. the, the, the fiscal management zeitgeist inside the ANC is very sound. I mean, what, what, what the minister did two weeks ago was very good. The ANC also has... But it's not delivery. consistent, but it's not consistent. Yeah, I mean, but the, the ANC if, also if the, has, yeah. has a delivery record <coughs> that is better than many of its critics concede early on. You know, in its first decade, it doubled the number of people with jobs. It, it built 10 formal houses for every shack that had newly been... Isn't it an interesting position to get into to argue in favour of the ANC's delivery record? The, the, the Many of the individuals who were responsible for that, the technocrats, those skills haven't departed. They exist in a sort of ecosystem around the ANC. Many of the opposition players, particularly the newer ones, have no experience in government. They, they, they have no experience of foreign policy or, or, or at all. They have actual no real experience of on-the-ground delivery. So just from a strategic perspective, it makes sense to, where the circumstances are right, strike a deal that would allow the ANC also to be part of a future coalition administration. Yeah, but come if on. If that deal yeah, is right, on. I would support it. 
Uh, look, we spoke about the, the, the we spoke about New York, the diplomatic mission in the New York. But it's just it's not just New York. There are lots of mm -hmm. career diplomats in the system who are frustrated by the deployment by the African National Congress, not only of bad individuals suited in these positions, but many of the decisions are those people are afraid to say it out loud for all the reasons that we know. But this is, there are too many political decisions that are made at diplomatic and foreign relations yeah. level that shouldn't be made. Right. Well, that so, means at the at the I think time you're giving the, the NC too much power. Too much. The NC was no. didn't have experience at some point when it came. Surely, people would no, we can't said, say I mean, let them stay forever because they have the experience. It's nonsense. They've messed up. Initially, up. where are we? Initially, its record is better than its critics concede. Okay, that is correct. I, I mean, I I will say it's correct. I won't force you to say it's correct. I no, tell no, it. No, no. <laughs> Second thing I tell you is that once you get into the horse trading of coalition making. It's possible for all sides to begin setting key conditions. And if the conditions are set in a manner mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the ANC is prepared to compromise on meritocracy within the civil service, for example, and is to an extent, and as far as politicians are able to be held to account, held to account on that, then, of course, the, the deal works. I mean, the, the deal isn't a deal... Uh, if, if, you, if, you know, the ANC insists on perpetrating mm -hmm. wholly counterproductive ideas and policies. Now, the ANC has a lot of room to compromise. Its own supporters would, for example, surrender the policy of black economic empowerment if that was necessary to, a, to strike a constructive coalition deal on uh, the, the, the condition that the broader opposition would be more open to consider race in policy making. But you're also the, making the assumption that the ANC is one body. It's no longer one body. No, no, I, I don't make that assumption. I okay. don't make it at all. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I don't make that assumption at all. My assumption is that what pragmatic echoes exist still within it. I mean, the mm -hmm. finance ministry is one of those. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are efforts clearly to walk back the counterproductive. Uh, consequences of empowerment policy. There's the admission on, on cadre deployment. Of course, no action yet. Continue to perpetrate deployment. But the, the pressure of having to concede under a coalition uh, will must be utilized as an asset. And ANC supporters, the rank and file out there, deeply disappointed. I mean, we've, we've polled these guys up and down. And they, in fact, there they aren't, ANC, there are not very many ANC supporters left. There are about 10 million ANC voters left. But to confuse an ANC voter with an ANC supporter is a strategic mistake now. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing anymore. Yeah. Um, the, the, within the ANC rank and file, the, the actual support base, the membership, there is an appetite to compromise to a vast extent in order to strike a constructive deal with with an opposition option. So my point... But not the DA. Very, the, the DA is largely hated or suspected so most, by ANC the people. Most, they're not. The most... You're yeah. wrong. I'll tell you that. And <laughs> okay. okay. Let me make it... Let me show you just how complex it is. ANC uh -huh. voters concede the DA's two major marketing points. Mm -hmm. They concede that it governs better than their own party, and they concede that it is less corrupt. Do they of, really? I mean, they keep throwing to Cape Town townships at the DA. Whatever the we, DA says, we do something right. Let me it, explain to you what's going on. And younger and <laughs> going to Yemen. Okay. Let me explain to you what's going on. Yeah. ANC supporters concede these two points. Mm -hmm. It's a great challenge for the DA. Mm -hmm. But they go on and they say that the DA is a racist organization. Mm -hmm. When you try and test what that means, it doesn't mean... DA members form mobs with baseball bats, walk the streets, attack black people. What the ANC voter means is a much more important thing, that the DA doesn't get it. Their open opportunity society and, and what comes with it is so far removed from my reality that they might as well be telling us we're going to colonize Mars. And when the DA governs, we concede it will govern better than the ANC, and we concede it won't steal our money. But it will create, in the mind of an ANC voter, a two-tier society mm -hmm. in which we will forever live on the periphery. Now, it might be a better periphery. We might have better shacks or, or little houses. 
but you are asking us to vote for the historical colonial dynamic and we can't do it. And that is the is the challenge facing the DA. Is, it, is that what the DA stands with, for? I mean, your understanding of it, is that what it would do if it were to become the, the Mokulubasa of South African politics? I don't know what it would do. I think it's increasingly aware of this challenge. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great intellectual challenge. I, I don't know if it will rise to meet it or not. Mm -hmm. But that is where the ANC voter is at. The ANC voter, the way to conceive of the ANC voter is they are going through a divorce from their party. Mm -hmm. Their relationship with that party, as, 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 as many people know, mm -hmm. is not a normal brand sort of client relationship. Mm -hmm. They'd invested their expectations and hopes for dignity and for their children's dignity in the party. And initially, why I stress this ANC delivery record in the early years, mm -hmm. they delivered on that. But is it What's a divorce now, from the if party? You, if, you, if you focus group ANC voters, they right. talk about the relation a betrayal mm -hmm. and that they're in an abusive relationship. And in the mm -hmm. same manner that, that perhaps a sort of abusive partner in a relationship wants to get out, mm -hmm. they see every little flash of reform as perhaps the sign that maybe things are going to turn around. They disappointed again. But like, like you're right doing the with the finance minister, you're taking one little thing in the ANC, but the whole ANC is messed up. And you're taking one man yeah. who might disappear tomorrow, who might not be minister after the elections, and you think, oh, there's something, there's a spark of hope, something is getting better. I mean, the whole right, ANC is terrible. The finance minister is not a spark of hope, it's the financial management of the country. It's a wave <laughs> of potential. It's very important. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. I want us to move and talk. But yes. let's finish this. But I want us to talk about the action but, essay and other parties. Let me just tell you the last thing about the the ANC voter. Another reason the ANC voter cites not leaving is the fear of violence in the immediate aftermath of an electoral defeat. Right. And that's similar to, to a sort of abused partner saying, I, I'm, I'm afraid of getting out because you know, someone might find me and beat me in the street mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. If you remove these two considerations that you're asking us to vote for a colonial dynamic and we can't, which you can, of course, completely understand. Mm -hmm. You'd rather sit in the, in, sure. in, in the present mess than do that, because what you're being asked to concede is you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the fear of violence. Remove those two restraints on ANC voter departure mm -hmm. and, and the way that I read Who those must numbers, remove them? Who must remove those constraints? The idea well, of the, the ANC... The, the, political, the, 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 the political opposition needs to remove right. them. Right. And if they remove those two constraints, then um, the, 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 the ANC could... could is the, is the DA under Stephen Hazen having the kind of leader... I have much respect for him. Don't mis mis mm -hmm. misconstrue this. Is he? Do you think he understands those those those, those uh, obstacles? And 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 he thinks, or he would agree with you that there's a need to work harder at removing he those would. constraints. Yeah, I can tell you he would. Okay. Yeah, but it's very difficult to do. Yeah. I mean, what you're asking to do. I mean, remember what we're asking people to do. Is is this is probably the great unmet joint intellectual political challenge of the country. Mm -hmm that we've got to cross this historical divide, 400 years old, this divide. Mm -hmm. every, okay. every time we've got to a point of crisis, we have fallen back into our lagers and into, into, into the divide and rule of the past. Because we don't what, have a leader who's able to stand on a pedestal with a moral high ground and say, guys, 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 stop it. Yeah. And everybody no, we, would listen we don't to have them. That. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not going to have that either. No, don't say that. So the way we've got to get this right mm -hmm. is in a bureaucracy by putting five or six of these leaders in a room together mm -hmm. and saying to them, gentlemen, ladies, well, they're going to be men, mostly. They're going to be men. We'll say to them, <laughs> gentlemen, you, you must strike a deal. Right. So our salvation mm -hmm. is not going to be another great moment of, of, of a great leader because there isn't such a person. They all, I have enormous, the leaders of the country's political parties, the whole mm -hmm. spectrum, it's a mm -hmm. hell of a tough job. And it's easy to criticize them and say they so They have to work together for South Africa. They have and to it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Our salvation. So they have to put their egos aside and work together for the country. Yeah. Rather than a sort of great sort of leader, yeah. We're going to have a dead, boring bureaucracy that's going to thrash out a deal. 
Well, that's based on 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 the values that can inform the yeah. That's I totally agree with. If you look at a country, the investment to get us to grow again. If you look at a country like Switzerland, people don't only. If you ask people who's the president, they don't know who the president is. Yeah, well, what exactly they know, the what they have is a system that works, and the people exactly who are the employed there, they come in and go. It's not about the personalities; it's about and, and making our, sure the system works. Our political leaders, the whole lineup of them, that are all going to have a shot at making this deal in a few years' time, mm. but perhaps in two years' time, they, this is the deal that they're going to have to strike. Why can they strike the deal money. before the elections and not after the elections? It's very, well, yes, you should strike the deal before because the, the back-channel diplomacy should have settled things mm. long in advance. Mm. And so yeah, that is correct. I don't think they should be expected to declare before, any, they should do whatever they want. Mm. They shouldn't be expected to declare before, but, but what we must avoid is the is, is a, a risk I'm very worried about mm. is that the opposition is going to beat the ANC. Mm. Yeah, but and the next I'm... morning mm. they're going to turn on each other and tear each other to pieces mm. because yeah, risk. They, they're a dog that caught a car but and they don't this, know what to do with it. The reason I was and, arguing for something being done before the elections is because yes. there's a huge and a growing number of South Africans who are cut and fall of, of voting. They don't see why they should vote. Yeah, so something yeah. has to be given to them to say, look, you need to stand up and vote. Oh. Yes, here's a new deal that might make, inspire you again. Right. Yeah, look, if you say to voters, you know, are you going to vote? Lots of people say they won't. And when you say to them, why not? They say, because there's, there's no solution. Mm. And when you say to them, but by not voting, you don't contribute to a solution. They say that's correct. And you say, well, isn't there a contradiction in your position? And they say there is, but they say they're so fed up they're not going to. The reality is that the non-voters mm. are going to sign up when they see progress. Mm. And they concede that this is, is an internal contradiction. Yeah. So the election is actually going to be contested in the main amongst registered voters who are willing to vote. It's very difficult and very expensive to take a non-vote or non-registered vote and turn them into an active vote. Mm -hmm. Once the solution is in place through these voters, then I think you'll see levels of, of turnout uh, perhaps immediately after that, amongst okay. younger people and so on increase. Yeah. I would like you to place, um, and to just give, a few, give you a few minutes to make comment on your views on the Independent Electoral Commission one, the action is saying my money is my money and you know Zingis is Zingu, Z Z Z Z Z Jiba, okay, all these okay, people okay. Zingis, Zingis, Jiba, all these people are forming up their own political parties and I mean start with action as a because it seems to be growing it seems to be becoming in some level some level the darling of the new voter it's taking whom is it taking numbers from but I will also please also talk about okay. the IEC the, the, the numbers we've got on, on the ASA guys, they're polling at about 4%. About 35% um, of ASA supporters are black, about 65% white. Um, the, 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 it's, it's immensely important organization and, 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 and absolutely tremendous what Herman has done. Because what he is beginning, beginning to pioneer, what he's pioneered, and for which he must get a lot of credit, is um, what you might call, if, if you understand terms properly, black conservative politics in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I said to you at the beginning, when you were challenging me on the IRR, that opinion in South Africa is right of center. It's a much more conservative country than people realize. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons the ANC is losing support and previous alternatives haven't been able to capture it, there are many things, but one is the divorce process takes a while for ANC voters. So you must be a lag time between disappointment and exit. And people right. don't appreciate that. That has to be there. But also the message was always cast far more to the center left. And there's this fear that, you know, that's unspoken sometimes that South Africa will lurch leftwards and become sort of Venezuela and Zimbabwe. I think the risk is that South Africa is going to lurch rightwards and is going to become a, a Bolsonaro or Viktor Orban in Hungary. We, our public opinion is much more conservative. Now, now Herman is pioneering mm -hmm. um, that politics and, and, and that's a, a great contribution to the country, whether he, he succeeds or not, he'll, he'll have left the example on the political battlefield for others to pick up. Mm. 
Where's all the new political action in South Africa? The EFF splits from the ANC a few years back, but you know, maybe yeah, there's still parties at night. But all the all the action is not on the left. All these sort of dreams of former trade unionists and cast off of Scargill in Britain that we'll have this great leftist Marxist People's Party. Nothing. All the action is centre right. It's mm-hmm. It's Herman, the pioneer of it. Mm-hmm. What uh, Ravonia Circle and Songhezo Zibi have, have just launched again. They've, they've mm-hmm. launched their movement now. Mm-hmm. Is 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 pragmatic, centrist, old style ANC gear thinking, as I I read it. Yeah. The 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 interests of the universe around around Mr. Mbeki at the age of eighty, the future of the ANC. Some people think. Is Songhezo yeah. going to revive the old ANC guys who were? Must, who, are, who are disappointed in the fall of the? It seems like they're gathering around. You must, you must ask Songhezo what he will do. But mm. I think Songhezo is is very well positioned mm. to capture um, the pragmatism mm. that was once, as I have argued for you this morning, and you've done well to challenge me on it. It's great talking to you. I must say, Thank most you. of these interviews, people just accept what you say. You made <laughs> it hard. It's brilliant. I enjoy talking uh, to you too. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Gates was well positioned on that. Musi Maimane has launched uh, BOSA, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, um, center-right, pragmatic, all of that all over again. Um, none of this is accidental. Herman didn't, you know, he says he's an accidental mayor, but and 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 so Gezel just didn't just erupt and from nowhere and and he's and I mean very brave what he's doing, you know, a, a chap who stands up from successful career in journalism and, and then in banking and says, you know, stuff it, I'm I'm going to change it. It's yeah. Wonderful. Right. And and what Moosey's doing, you know, he had a really hard time in 2019. He's come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, very, very strongly and with a with a very useful political offering. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't think the public is grateful enough to politicians. But and the people splitting the opposition. Do. Surely the pie can only remain this big. So the more political parties offerings, as you call them, come in, the more we are clearly irrevocably into this era of coalitions. But the more of them you have out there, the more power you, the ANC is going to retain. Because then a lot of times it's about what position do you give me? I have 10 seats here, 5 seats here, I can vote for you over there. What do you give us? Uh, That's what it's all about. We will. South Africa is learning its way through coalitions. I, I think there are a few wise interventions to introduce now. One is a threshold. Mm. So let's say two, two and a half percent. If you're not at that, you don't get represented. Yeah. That cuts out the real chances and, and, and the small guys. It's not anti-democratic either, mm. because you can form, a, if you're serious and you really want a future in politics, you can form a joint list mm. and, and you can get your two, two and a half percent. Right. Second thing that's going to have to happen are legally binding coalition agreements. Mm. You thrash out that deal. And then like a, a commercial transaction, you buy a business or you strike a deal with your partners, you stick to that deal. Right. I think the, the, the only way around those deals must be substantive objections to, mm. to real substantive breaches. Mm. And we should introduce the office of an ombudsman of coalitions. Mm, to judge idea. whether the infraction has indeed been substantive. Introduce that those interventions. We can we can try and do a run at that uh, next year, even as, as a country. I think there's prospects for the bigger parties to agree on this, and coalitions become automatically much more stable. But, but again, the, the sort of overhead view is in a proportional representation system such as ours. It we were always going to become a parliamentary system that looks like a hybrid between the current Bundestag in Germany or the Knesset in Israel. Where, And I, I think in by the end of this decade, our biggest political parties are going to have 20, 30% of the vote. Mm. And there can be a whole lot of parties with, with four or 5%. And three or four of these are going to get together to form a government and a binding agreement. And right. that is the that is the the should, should we retain the constitutional mm. uh, uh, protections we yeah. gained as a country twenty five years ago? That's what will happen. And in a dead, boring, bureaucratic kind of slugging it out, as long as it delivers services. 
People let me say we, people don't yeah. really care whether the president of the country is gay, lesbian, or, or straight, or Muslim, or Christian, or Christian, or whatever. As long as the person does what they must do for the people, for the country, that's what South Africans care about. That's right. I believe that. Quite do right. you? What do you make of the IEC? Should should we keep more scrutiny on it? Or yeah, are you... yeah, do keep more scrutiny. Not only because. There are so few institutions that fully escape the tentacles of malfeasance that keep great scrutiny. Um, the the we my the SRF has got the ANC on likely turnout about 46, 47 percent. The the Oppenheimer family through their Brenthurst think tank put it in the same place about a week ago or so. And, and some of the other polling I see is also 47, 48. Now, you know, it's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's quite a dangerous territory because to fiddle two or three percentage points, you can do. Right. To Once it, it, it goes to, to 40 and below, you probably can't, mm. can't sneak over the line. To right, use right, that analogy, right, right, so right. lots of scrutiny. But I think our, our media, which is excellent on many of these things, our civil society, which are mm. which are which are great, um, give us a reasonable prospect okay. of managing that risk. Franz, is there something that you hoped I would ask you that I didn't ask that you think needs to be said before we close? No, I'd, I'd say. I'd say that you know one one I, you you said I've you know done a lot of assessments of where South Africa is headed and why and 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 that and in fact the first call that the ANC would lose in 2024, I think my colleagues and I made in 2012 in print the first mm. so we can wow. in the independent group. Right. The thing I've struggled with the most is is that very often I haven't helped my clients because they have heard it, but they've had to wait for it to happen to believe that it was real. And um, I've, I've developed a well-deserved bearish reputation over the past 15 years. Um, because I said, I thought the lights would go out and I didn't think Mr. Ramaphosa would be a successful reformer. And mm -hmm. I thought growth would be trapped to sub 1% and we'd get big social blowups. Mm -hmm. and we thought the ANC would lose and we thought the political action inevitably lay on the center right, not on the left. Right. Um, the, the same methodologies that made those calls possible, which, which was, which was a, a hard determination to, I mean, to, to look at the numbers, firstly, we've got a lot of numbers that other people don't have. It's hard to do this analysis without that. And, and second thing is, is, is really to be, also an echo of an earlier answer to you, to be very reluctant to be influenced by outside opinion and, and, and critics mm -hmm. is the same methodology that's still being used today and, and causes me to be more hopeful about our prospects now and potential for reform than mm -hmm. really at any point in the last 15 years. But reform has to be driven by a coalition or a collaboration of parties. Yeah. It's not going to be yeah. the ANC is too comfortable in power. After 28 of years of power, yeah. many people in the ANC still don't see anything wrong. Well, they look at us and say, what are you guys talking about? Well, well, it's it's certainly not true for its supporters. Mm. They mm. they if if you uh, uh, read and and uh, I sent your colleagues some of the sort of yeah. short reports we issue, ANC voters are are more critical of the performance of their party than mm. often are members of the but opposition. They, well, they're just like the the Kusatu, they they they, toy -toy, they make noise and then they go back to vote for oh, it. But the vote, <laughs> remember, it's the voters. The voters yeah. don't. The, mm. there's, there's, a, there's this strange South African phenomenon of important people saying something must be done. There yeah. must be a reform movement. Mm. Someone must put one together. Mm. We're far past the point of no return on that because the someone is the voting public. Correct. When I was sort of was a young analyst, the ANC was polling at 70%. I've, I've, I've got it 30 sort of odd percentage points down from that now. Those days are gone. The reform movement is the voting public. They are okay. far ahead of the leadership of business or academia or, mm. or other institutions mm. in actually 
bringing about the change they wish to see. Okay. And in the end, uh, if you're a free society as we are, what the ANC leaders think or want becomes irrelevant when you face this tide of public um, disappointment. Yeah. And that tide of public disappointment will give us a chance. Let me put it that way. So, In the, the immediate future, they will give us a chance of striking a deal upon which we will be able to grow to reach our great potential. And if you look mm. at countries in trouble around the world, you realize how lucky we are to be in that position. Right. That we're going to get a serious chance to do this. Okay. If the people in that room can get over themselves and make the deal in the best interest of the people of the country. And that is the source of the of the optimism. Yeah. Look, this, the sands are still shifting, isn't it? So let's, let's wait for them to settle a little bit and, and maybe have another conversation sometime in 2023, ahead of 2024. Be delighted to. Thank you very Franz, much. Franz Cunier, you've been an amazing interlocutor. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you us. very much. Have a lovely day. You too. That's Franz Cunier from the Social Research Institute of South Africa. Bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, there was an amazing conversation with Franz Cunier, as I said earlier, of the Social Research Institute of South Africa. He's a man who is constantly him and of course his colleagues his team observing the shifting sands where they're going where they're going to land the speed and the impact of their landing out of that the rest of us can only keep watching and following just like them uh this has been solomon at worldview the place where we explore everyone's perspective so that we can burn our own perspective and worldview thank you very much bye-bye